programme, we are going to talk about a scorpion. A most unusual scorpion, Scorpius, the scorpion in the sky. Well on view now. One of the loveliest of all constellations. It is rather low down. Go further south, you see it better. Nevertheless, it's well worth looking at. And there's plenty to see inside the scorpion. And uh, welcome again to one of our oldest friends, Dr. John Mason. Welcome nice back. to be here, Patrick. Now, what are the legends of Scorpius? Well, of course, in the sky, Orion was the great hunter, of course, and he boasted that he could kill uh, any uh, creature in the, in, on Earth. And I think this rather upset the gods on Mount Olympus, who got a bit uh, uh, upset about it. They did, you know. And they decided to teach him a lesson. Yeah. And they sent a scorpion after him, and uh, the scorpion was so small, Orion didn't see it, and uh, it stung him on the heel and killed him. I think they felt a bit sorry after that. Yes. They put him up in the sky. But it's but. wonderful where they placed the Orion and the Scorpion, wasn't it? Right or opposite. They can never be above the horizon together. Yeah, that's rather good, I think. Now, the Scorpion, of course, at this time of year, any time between 11 o'clock and 1 in the morning, is right down low in the southern yes, sky. Very low. And it is a wonderful sight. You can find it easily yes. because, of course, we've got the brilliant planet Jupiter just above and to the left of the Scorpion. So if you go out, look to the south, there's Jupiter shining away. And if you come down to the right, you'll find the Scorpion's brightest star, which is Antares. And there is a Scorpius consists of a long line of brightest stars. And one of the very few constellations that does give some impression of the creature it's meant to represent. You can picture a scorpion there with Antares right in the middle. Antares, of course, and the upper parts of the scorpion we see well from Britain. The long tail of stars curves below the horizon from yes. southern England and then comes up again. And then in theory, you should just be able to see the Saturn Shoal or the stars in the sting. I but can't. I have to say I've never seen them. Not from here, but from further south, they're lovely. They are. Now the brightest star, of course, is Antares, yes. and that is a fascinating star. It's a red supergiant star. Its radius is 3.8 times the average distance of Earth from the Sun. Now, that means that if you dropped this enormous star into the middle of our solar system, it would extend from the center out well into the asteroid belt. So Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars would all be inside it. I must say, to either side of Antares, there's a fainter star. Sigma and Tor Scorpius so is the middle of three. The whole region around Antares is incredibly rich. You've got lots of nebulosity around Antares itself because of these stellar winds. And then above Antares, as we see it, as we cross over the border into neighbouring Fucus, the 13th constellation yeah. of the Zodiac, oh, yes. the one that astrologers always forget, right. that constellation, of course, we've got the beautiful Row of Fuki cloud with lots of dark nebulae, regions of glowing clouds of dust and gas, emission nebulae where new stars are being born and lovely colors because you can't see those colors by just by looking at it they've got to be photographed yes and of course we had some beautiful photographs oh, taken indeed. of it showing the colors uh, really lovely now if you come back to Antares and move just very slightly to the west of Antares there is one of the finest globular clusters in the sky now globular clusters of course are very closely packed concentrations. Huge symmetrical systems. Yes, uh, football-shaped systems yes. of stars, very old stars. Yes. They form a halo around the Milky Way galaxy, uh, and they contain some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. And this one is just about the nearest, about 7,000 light-years. Yes, whether it's the nearest or one of the nearest, we're not too sure, but it's about 7,000 light-years away. And uh, certainly, uh, you can see it easily in binoculars, and uh, with telescope, it, it is a very fine object. Now, above and to the right of Antares, as we move up towards the top of the constellation, we have the three stars, uh, Beta, Delta and Pi. Graphius, Dezuba and Pi. And those, of course, make the upper part of the, the front of the scorpion's body, I suppose, as we look at it. The interesting one there is Dezuba. It was just below the second magnitude and seemed a perfectly ordinary star. And then suddenly it flared up by almost a magnitude and altered the entire look of that area. Yes, it's not, uh, not normal no, that in your no. human lifetime a star changes no. very obviously in brightness, but Delta Scorpii certainly is one example. Of course, Beta Scorpii, a nice double star. Now, if you go from Antares yeah. towards Beta Scorpii, about halfway between the two is another lovely globular cluster, but this one is rather different in character to M4. Much further away and uh, much more concentrated. Yes, M80 is about just over 30,000 light-years yeah. away. 
And as you say, it's got this densely packed yes. core. In fact, it's one of the most densely packed globular clusters we know. It's got several hundred thousand stars packed into a region only about 90 light years across. And that means that if you yeah. were on a planet going yeah. round a star in that globular, the sky would be full of these brilliant stars. Now, of course, if we come back to Antares, below Antares, we then have the line of stars from Epsilon, Mu and Zeta, where the tail of a scorpion dips down below the horizon as seen from southern Britain. That's where we lose it, sadly. Yeah, but there are some beautiful objects in that region. As you come down from Mu towards Zeta at the bottom, you've got lots of beautiful clusters. There's NGC 6242, the open cluster. That's a beauty. And there's a wonderful area of emission nebulosity, uh, IC 46. 628. Yeah. And then as you come towards Zeta 1, Zeta 2, which is where the tail turns the corner, as it were, you've got a lovely cluster just above NGC 6231, a beautiful open cluster. Now, if you come round the corner then, which is well below the horizon for yeah, us, yeah. and then you come back up, the tail then curves back up to the sting, past Iota, you then come to the star Gertab, and then to Shawla and the Sath, which are the two stars at the end of the sting. Now, if you take a line from Shaula through the Sath and you carry on into the middle of the curve of the tail, oh, yes. there you've got the lovely Bug Nebula, <laughs> NGC 6302. Now, this is a very interesting uh, object because uh, it shows you the great diversity of the processes that take place when sun-like stars die. They swell up to become red giants, they then become unstable, they puff off their outer layers, producing planetary nebulae. And then the white hot core is exposed, which finally shrinks and cools as a white dwarf. Now, we're used to planetary nebulae having more shell-like structures, where we have things like the ring nebulae. Yes, indeed. Or dumbbell shapes like the dumbbell in Vulpecula. Yes. But here we've got this really asymmetric ejection of material. It's almost like a fan, or some people call it the butterfly nebula. But it really has these sort of wings mm -hmm. of emission coming out either side of the star. Not very easy to see telescopically, though. No, indeed not. Above the sting, we have two of the loveliest open thrusters of the sky. M7 and N6, Ptolemy's thruster, and the butterfly cluster. Yes, now M7, of course, is so bright, you can see it easily the naked eye. That's why it was recorded by Ptolemy in ancient times. It is a glorious cluster. And you can see it's uh, about uh, 100 loosely scattered stars. There's a, a lovely orangey-red star as an outlier to the cluster, and it is a very fine sight. And, of course, when you look at it with the naked eye, it just looks like a fuzz. Binoculars will show it, and a rich field telescope, it is a wonderful sight. About 6,000 light years away. Yes. And then above and to the right of that, of course, we have the rather more compact butterfly cluster. Much further away. Indeed. And again, fewer stars here, but you do have this definite sort of double fan shape. Again, uh, it's a nice sight in binoculars, but a rich field telescope shows it magnificently. And of course, you're against the background of the Milky Way. Oh, yes. So the whole background is a wonderful, rich oh, yeah. vista oh, yeah, of stars. Yeah, now, if you go from those two open clusters a little over to the west, you have two more emission nebulae, and these are certainly not easy to see in small telescopes, but you have the Cat's Paw oh, yes. Nebula and the so-called Lobster Nebula. <laughs> Now, there you can see the two of them, the cat's paw above and to the left. You can see the circular blobs of pink here in this uh, lovely photograph, which is supposed to be the paws of the cat's one paw. One paw short, I think. I think it's one pad <laughs> short. Yes, you're right. But it certainly is a beautiful object. And you can see there the uh, wonderful lanes of dark dust, the uh, clouds of gas being lit up from within by the young stars. Now, below and to the right of that, we have um, a nebula which is uh, sometimes called the Lobster Nebula. It's also called the War and Peace Nebula, though. How on earth War and Peace can have a shape? I'm not too sure. I have no idea, but certainly a lobster. Yes, I can pick the yes, lobster Yes, I can there, see a lobster can, there yeah. if you've got, yeah. you've got the big claws yeah, and the, the rest claws, of it. I can. Um, and again, this is a lovely starbirth region, wonderful areas of, of glowing gas and dust with lots of young stars within. Let's now come back to oh, the yes. sting, the Sass and Shawla. Now, they are part of a very large association of hot, youngish stars known as the Scorpius OB-1 Association. That's very interesting and important, too. Now, the Scorpius OB-1 Association may have been uh, a lot closer to us going back millions of years. 
Now, there is an interesting idea here that uh, if the Scorpius Obi-Wan association passed within a few hundred light years of the sun, which is possible, that if you had a supernova in that cluster, it could actually lead to effects on the Earth. And this has been one of the many theories put forward for the Ordovician mass extinction 440 million years ago. Yes. The second worst mass <laughs> extinction in the history of our planet. Only the Permian was worst. I'm not sure I believe it personally, but I don't think idea. I do. Nevertheless, um, if we did have a supernova close to us, it would be unfortunate. John, thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. So the Scorpion is there now. Go out, find Jupiter, locate the Scorpion, that long line of stars winding down towards the horizon. You'll agree, the Scorpion really is a lovely constellation. But I agree, it's better seen from further south. And Chris had been over in California. While he was there, he caught up with the sidewalk astronomers. All you might expect to see from the high street of Monrovia are the bright lights of downtown LA, just 20 miles away. But the sidewalk astronomers have been showing the public the skies from places like this for almost 40 years. Boy, that is big. Uh, it's nice. Oh, wow. Each month, they have a different star of the show. Last month, Saturn. Tonight, the moon. All right, now we can put her on the moon. Their guru is John Dobson, who at 91 is still traveling the world to spread his message. Get out and enjoy the celestial show. Quite a bit of turbulence. Even in the city, you see, we can see planets in the moon. We don't have that problem. And with our fail-safe sun telescopes, we can show the sunspots. That's what we sidewalk astronomers do, you see. We make telescopes for other people to look through, and we take them to where the people in this world are in the good seeing conditions. What do you think people expect when they come and look through one of your telescopes? A lot of people walk by and they won't look. Uh, and some, some look and they're not very interested and walk away. But some are flabbergasted. They just flabbergasted. Wow! Yeah. Especially the Japanese. We were up at Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and uh, the Japanese were looking at the telescope. Whoa! Whoa! They go like this, and they light up the whole park. <laughs> John's enthusiasm has never wavered, and he still enjoys making sure his visitors know about the objects that they're seeing. I often ask people, if you lived on the moon, how often would the sun rise? Once a month. Yes, sure, you know, <laughs> but they don't know. Some people say never, some people say always, somebody say every day. So then I tell them that if you lived on the moon, the sun would come up only once a month, and it comes up and stays up for two weeks at a stretch, and the rocks get hotter than boiling water. And then it goes down for two weeks, and the rocks get colder than dry ice. Anyway, so I tell them that we're not going to do farming on the moon. And I also tell them that only the shady side is cool. You see, they look through the telescope, oh, cool. Then I have to say, only the shady side is cool. <laughs> oh, that is cool. Yep. Come see the moon. Come over here and look at the moon. It's free. John is best known as the inventor of the Dobsonian telescope. Homemade from everyday objects, they're extremely easy to manhandle around the sky. Couldn't be easier. And then we're on the moon. Fantastic. Traditionally, even the mirrors are handmade by polishing glass. Jane Houston Jones is proud of her 20-year-old Dobsonian. And it's made from leftovers. It's made from leftovers. This is a big cardboard tube. Uh, this is a wood shingle, a dowel from my closet that mm -hmm. I cut in, uh, cut into small pieces. Um, the focuser is just a um, just a drain pipe, and. Um, you can see the nice movement of the focus. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So you can't get a better movement, no matter how expensive you are. <laughs> That's right. And the whole lot would cost you, this is a 12-inch telescope, so... And this is a 10-inch. 10-inch, sorry. This is a 10-inch, and it cost me, 20 years ago, it cost me $200 to make. About. It would be about uh, Probably twice, 300 now. 300 so it's about, uh, what, 150 that pounds? That, yeah. that includes the mirror. The mirror is about half the cost of the telescope. But this is my first and my favorite, and its name and the, is Stardust. the one that comes out. This is the one that comes out on the sidewalk. Yes. Oh, you can do it either wow. way. Already that is too out. cold. Astro, oh my gosh. This makes you want to okay, sit outside in the cold. <laughs> this is why we do it, to get the wows. 
Yeah. Wow. <laughs> we don't accept money, but we accept wow. <laughs> well, it's been a fantastic night, and it's wonderful to watch so many people seeing the moon for the first time. It's a reminder of how I became interested in astronomy. Ah, you want to come see the moon? Yeah, why don't Yeah! That seemed to be great fun. Now, for our news notes, uh, I'm going to begin with the occultation of Venus. The moon passed in front of Venus and hid it for more than an hour. And lovely sight was both were in the crescent stage. And from Celsius, the sky was clear. I had a very nice view with binoculars, and also with the naked eye. I was surprised how bright Venus was with the naked eye, even in the middle of the day, once you knew where it was. Also, talking about Venus, remember, the messenger probe has passed Venus on its way to Mercury and has sent back very nice pictures, Chris. Yes, this was the last flyby of Messenger past Venus, so a chance to test the instruments and calibrate them before arriving at Mercury. Here's a nice sequence of Venus receding into the distance for the last time for Messenger. And with Venus, of course, what you're looking at is the thick atmosphere, yes, and that's indeed. what we're trying to understand. And that's why this flyby is important, because not only did we have Messenger looking at the planet, Venus Express was on the other side of the globe, keeping an eye on it, and there are a whole host of ground-based observations as well. So putting these together should help us understand how Venus got its thick sulfuric acid atmosphere. Now going further out to Mars, now we have caves there. These are results from the Odyssey spacecraft, and these black dots aren't camera faults or something yeah, wrong with the images. These are caves on the surface of Mars. I have to say, these are good places for Martians to hide, Patrick. I wonder what kinds of Martians Well, <laughs> probably not little green men, yeah, although they would be nice accommodation. But if there are bacteria living on the surface, this sort of environment is an intriguing possibility it could well be. for life on Mars. Then further out to the Kuiper Belt, where we find Pluto, we also find many other objects, including Eris, which is definitely larger than Pluto, and we now know is considerably more massive. That's right. In fact, we now know it's definitively 27% more massive. So Pluto is not only demoted from being a planet, it's not even the most massive thing out beyond Neptune anymore. Now, let's go much further out to way beyond our solar system, a double supernova. Yes. Now, a supernova is supposed to mark the end of a star's right. life. A star much bigger than the sun rips itself apart. So this should be a one-off. In 2004, this galaxy, UGC 4904, appeared to have a supernova, but it vanished, was never confirmed, and wasn't reported at the time. Then last year, in October, the real thing happened, a genuine supernova at exactly the same position. So what this appears to be is a massive star that underwent some kind of outburst, just as Eta Carinae, much, much closer, did in 1850 or so, and then, after that initial outburst, two years later, ended its life. It's the first time we've seen this repeated pattern of explosions which get closer and closer together yes. before ending their lives in a supernova. And that's what seems to have happened here. Very odd indeed. <laughs> One never knows. Chris, thank you very much. Pleasure. Well, it's newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, send your stamp to desk envelope to Newsletter 106, The Sky at Night, BBC, Birmingham, B11, 1RF. And when I come back next month, I'll be talking about robotic telescopes. Until then, good night. Julie Andrews stars in the story of theatre and vaudeville legend Gertrude Lawrence. Star is at 12.50, the next here on BBC Two, a visit to Longleat. <laughs>